I guess, as usual, the uh, staff here at the Memory and Aging Center is more organized than I am. So um, I wanted to, again, uh, thank everyone here for really all your contributions to our research. We are very uh, concerned uh, with developing new therapies for neurodegenerative diseases, and we can't do it without all of your participation in our research. So really, thanks, and, and keep participating. So. Um, I think everyone here knows that uh, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases is really increasing as the baby boomer population in this country and also worldwide uh, ages. And we really think that this is going to be a, a very huge. Uh, closer? Yeah. Okay. So we want. We really think this is going to be a huge problem for our healthcare system uh, to deal with in terms of expense and caregiver burden and other things. And um, so we really need to think of some ways that we can decrease the number of patients with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And so we're really focused on treatments. Do we have a pointer? Do we have a pointer? No. Okay. So we're really focused on uh, treatments that can. Uh, decrease the number of new cases of, of dementia and so really flatten out this curve. So how do we do this? Well, um, we've learned a lot about Alzheimer's disease over the years by studying uh, brains of people who've passed away and studying people in our observational research. And so we know that under the microscope, the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are these fried egg things you see, you see on the left called uh, amyloid plaques, and they're made of a protein called beta amyloid protein. And then there are other uh, things called tangles, neurofibrillary tangles, which uh, fill up the nerve cells and give them problems with functioning, and they're made of a protein called tau protein. And so our colleagues, uh, many of our colleagues, some of whom work here, oh, thank you, have been able to uh, take the uh, genes for these disorders and actually put them into mice and create what we call Mouseheimer's disease. So there's human Alzheimer's disease and there's Mouseheimer's disease, and this has really been a boon to our discovery of new therapies. So. Um, these mice, just like human Alzheimer's patients, have a lot of trouble with memory and, and often it leads to their demise. Um, and the important thing to know is that we've cured Alzheimer's disease hundreds of times. And really the challenge for us as clinicians, as, as clinical trial researchers, is to take these Alzheimer's treatments and make them work in humans because so far none of the Alzheimer's cures has been an Alzheimer's cure. So, we're now about, tw we now have about 20 years, we're going into our sort of 20th year of doing large clinical trials um, in Alzheimer's disease with some of these Alzheimer's cures. And we've learned a lot of hard lessons, many strikes, many pop flies, um, a few times the pitcher hit the batter. Um, but more recently, we're starting to get some singles, doubles, and triples, and I think people even in the, over the past couple days have heard of not quite a home run, but maybe between a double and a triple from a new drug. Um, and we're learning that some of these drugs that are able to treat the or uh, remove the amyloid from the brain may actually be a promising treatment, and we're now also working on treatments that affect other uh, parts of Alzheimer's disease. So. Um, you may have heard from others that uh, we think that Alzheimer's disease is a process that occurs over many years, and it usually starts when people are still cognitively normal. People pass through a stage called mild cognitive impairment where you have a few memory problems, but uh, you can usually still function. And then by the time the memory problems get so severe that you can't function very well, we call it dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And what we know now from many years of studies is that the amyloid protein, those fried egg things that I showed under the microscope, builds up probably 10, 20, 30 years before you even have any symptoms at all of Alzheimer's disease. And um, the tau protein, those tangles I showed you, actually build up much more closely in relationship to the symptoms over here. So, so what have we learned from all of these uh, failed Alzheimer's trials? Well, most of the trials when we use these new anti-amyloid drugs that didn't work, it was because we probably used them too late. So we started giving them to people who already had pretty severe memory problems. And by this point, the amyloid was already sitting around in the brain for 20 or 30 years, and it was probably too late for these drugs to really have much of an effect. So um, based on this, uh, we have now, we and others are now uh, doing clinical trials in people who are either normal or who have very, very mild symptoms of memory problems, 
or even using brain scans that can detect amyloid early in the course of the disease before you have any symptoms. And uh, one of the trials called the A4 study, you may have gotten a handout on your table about that, is actually going on here. And other trials are going on around the world. So we think that if we can remove this amyloid before you have a symptom, that may really be the secret to getting these drugs to work well. And so we can do that now because we have new uh, PET scan technology, and we use this a lot here now, that can detect the amyloid uh, or these tangles, this tau protein, even uh, in living people. So previously, 10, 15 years ago, we had to look, the only way to see amyloid or tau in the brain was to look at autopsy. But now we can use these brain scans and identify people who have uh, amyloid in the brain, uh, even before they have symptoms, and then uh, intervene with one of these therapies to remove amyloid, and I'll tell you in a minute, hopefully to remove tau as well in the future, uh, and we think this is really going to be the secret uh, to uh, curing these disorders. So this is what we call a prevention approach to uh, therapeutics. and. Um, what we would do is that we would find people, and this is actually what we're doing, who may have, may be at risk for Alzheimer's disease. You could be a healthy older person because age is the biggest risk factor. We would do an amyloid imaging study, and if we saw amyloid, if we saw that there was a lot of amyloid in your brain, we would give you one of these anti-amyloid drugs that removes the amyloid before you have any symptoms. And we hope that by doing that, that's going to prevent the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And this is actually the principle behind this A4 uh, anti-amyloid study that's being funded by the NIH that is going on here and around the country. So. Um, I think while we're very enthusiastic about this approach to using anti-amyloid drugs, we have to acknowledge that there may be some limitations as well. So we know that some people who are cognitively normal and uh, pass away uh, in their 80s, 90s, and go to autopsy actually have a biochemical evidence of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, including a lot of amyloid and tau, and yet they never had any symptoms. And so maybe we need to think about other ways to treat this disease. Maybe amyloid isn't the only approach. Um, it's also unclear exactly how well these new brain scans and other tests that we're developing really predict uh, who will get Alzheimer's disease. And so the question is, is even if you could detect amyloid 20 or 30 years before someone gets sick, not everyone who has amyloid in their brain is going to get sick, and how do we decide who to give the drug? And so this is an open question. Um, and the other question is, how early would we need to treat? Do we want to start treating people in their 20s or 30s? That seems like it might be a little impractical. Uh, and so for this reason, we're thinking about alternative approaches to early treatment with amyloid drugs. Um, and this alternative approach that we really are focusing uh, on here at UCSF is to try and remove tau from the brain. Because as I showed you, tau is much more closely linked to the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. It comes up later in the disease, and so it gives us more of a window to potentially intervene. Uh, so what is tau? Tau is a protein that stabilizes these structures called microtubules. Um, so in the lower uh, left-hand panel, you see this tube-like structure that gives a neuron its tree-like structure. And the red lines around the tree are actually the, the glue that's holding this microtubule together. And that's the tau protein that goes amiss in Alzheimer's disease. So what happens? So it actually falls off the microtubule. The microtubule starts to fall apart, and the nerve cell starts to shrink up and die because it doesn't have this nice uh, girder to hold it together. Um, the tau also clumps up, and we think that those clumps of tau, which are what we see as neurofibrillary tangles, are a real problem. So there are a variety of ways that we can treat tau problems. First one is just to try and make up for its falling off of the microtubule and trying to put an artificial girder in place to stabilize the microtubule. And so what those drugs are called are microtubule stabilizers. And we are actually doing a clinical trial, the only one in the world right now, of a microtubule stabilizer called TPI-287. Some people may actually be participating in this trial. And this actually makes up for the loss of tau and helps to restore, we hope, the function of the microtubules. 
I think what we're also very interested in, and I think a lot of the work was actually pioneered here by Dr. Stan Prusner, who won the Nobel Prize for this idea of toxic protein spreading from cell to cell, is that we've learned over the past few years that not only can this uh, loss of tau be a pro problem, but the clumping together of tau is a real problem, and these clumps can spread from one nerve cell to another nerve cell. And it's this spread of this toxic clump of tau that may also be a huge problem in Alzheimer's disease and other disorders. And so what we now have are antibodies that in our Mouseheimer's model, and these two pictures at the bottom you see are actually from Mouseheimer's disease. And you can see on the left is a, is a Mouseheimer brain that wasn't treated with a tau, uh, this tau antibody. And on the right is one that was treated. And you see the, all the dark stuff are those neurofibrillary tangles. So we think this is another really exciting approach that may have a huge impact both on Alzheimer's disease but on other forms of neurodegeneration. And I think within the next six months to a year, we're going to start testing uh, some of these antibodies in humans. And as I mentioned, it's not just Alzheimer's disease that these antibodies might work for, these other tau therapies, because although Alzheimer's disease is the most common tau-related neurodegenerative disease, there are a lot of other disorders that uh, are related to tau, including progressive supranuclear palsy and corticobasal syndrome that uh, uh, Christine just mentioned. And so we think that treating uh, these diseases really is important and that tau-based drugs are really going to be the secret to many uh, brain diseases. The other important thing that we've learned is that Alzheimer's disease is a lot more complicated than Alzheimer's disease, and I said that to you already, but just as an example, when we look at people who come to autopsy, this pie chart is really sort of a, a graph of how many people really have pure Alzheimer's disease. This is out of about 500 people in Chicago who lived in the community and died from Alzheimer's disease. Only less than 50 percent, that little light blue wedge there, had pure Alzheimer's disease, and the rest of the people had some mixture of Alzheimer's vascular disease another protein called TDP43, or Parkinson's disease. And so it may be that just focusing on one protein in Alzheimer's disease is going to be complicated because there are a whole lot of other things going on in Alzheimer's disease. So um, another approach that we're taking is instead of wasting a very uh, elegant drug that can remove tau or stabilize microtubules first in Alzheimer's disease, that we might focus on a type of uh, disease where we know there's a much stronger link to tau. And so um, for these tau disorders, we've really heavily focused on PSP, FTD, and CBD because we know that in, in some of these cases, really the, the main and really the primary problem is tau, and we don't have to worry about these other problems getting in the way of, of our treatment. So that's been a big focus of our effort that we're pursuing now. Um, and we're very active with clinical trials. These are some of the clinical trials that we have going on here at UCSF right now. We hope that some of you will be interested in participating. I know that many of you already are. There's the uh, study we're doing in healthy elders to detect uh, amyloid before you have any problems and treat you with an anti-amyloid drug. That's the A4 trial. We're doing a number of trials in early Alzheimer's disease with antibodies and other drugs. Um, we also have trials going on in frontotemporal dementia, uh, both in genetic forms as well as in sporadic forms, and in corticobasal syndrome and progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, we're very thankful to, again, everyone in the room for, for helping and participating in these studies. So. Um, just to summarize, uh, what I told you is that um, we're, you know, amyloid therapies uh, haven't worked as well as we had hoped so far, but we think we may understand why. And it may be that if we give them early enough, they really are going to help to cure Alzheimer's disease. We think that tau actually may be a better target for these drugs, and uh, that's what we're really heavily focused on these days. And not only that, but when we have a new tau drug, we want to focus not just on Alzheimer's disease, but diseases like PSP and FTD, where there may be a better bet for testing the disorder. So with that, thank you, and uh, sorry I went over a little bit. <laughs>